Well, good evening to everyone. Um, <laughs> this is a bit of a surprise. I, I don't know. I gave a talk on the Pope's encyclical on God is love a couple of months ago, and there, <laughs> I, guess, I guess Dan Brown is more popular than the Pope. No, but I, 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 can, under, I can understand. The Pope we can trust. We don't know about Dan Brown, you know, so, so I can understand a lot of you are, are here this evening. Uh, I think there are a lot of uh, non-Catholics among us, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, could you just raise your hands, those that don't belong to the Catholic Church, just so that I can... That, that's wonderful. I'd like to wish you a special welcome, a very special welcome. And, and for those of you who, uh, who it might be the first time that you walk into the uh, Marguerite Bourgeois Center, since it's been transformed into uh, an education meeting center for the diocese, well, welcome to the Marguerite Bourgeois Center also. Uh, I think pretty soon we'll set up a closed-circuit system downstairs so that we can put the overflow downstairs when we have a big crowd upstairs. So, welcome. Um, the... These talks that I've been giving once a month follow the, a general format. There's about a presentation that lasts about an hour, and then we'll take a break and uh, just a stretch, and then a time for questions and answers, okay? And uh, what I'd like to say is that the topic that I've chosen, and I said it very clearly in the theme, is the Gospel of Judas, Gnostic Gospels, and a critical look at Dan Brown's uh, The Da Vinci Code. And so that's the order in which I'm going to be speaking this evening. I'll be speaking, first of all, about uh, the Gospel of Judas and uh, moving on from there. I have to tell you, the first time I heard about the Gospel of Judas was from my mother. Uh, my parents live in Hawkesbury, so we call each other, you know, quite regularly, you stay in, in touch. And one, one day, my mother says just the week before Easter, she says, uh, she says, uh, have you heard about uh, the, the new gospel that they've found? And I said, no, Mom, what are you talking about? She says, well, the gospel of Judas, and, and Judas is a good guy. They've found this out, you know? And I said, I said, Mom, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yes, 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 you're not following the news. And I said, well, that's true. So, uh, <laughs> so after she hung up, I went on the net, and I found out, well, more than I wanted to know about the gospel of Judas. And... And then I, I started talking with my mom about it, and I realized that uh, my, my mother is a very, uh, very not only uh, a deep faith, but a very educated faith. She reads a lot, but she knew nothing about the Gnostic Gospels, and I realized that this was a topic that was um, unknown to the majority of Catholics. And at the same time, I realized that Dan Brown's The, the Da Vinci Code uh, refers to the, these Gnostic Gospels in a way that is um, mixing a lot of people up. So I thought that you know, this would be a good topic, and obviously it is. So, so what is the Gospel of Judas? The Gospel, the gospel of Judas is part of a codex called the Codex Chakos. Uh, a codex is um, different than a scroll. A scroll is uh, kind of a a seamless uh, piece of either parchment or papyrus that you roll up, you know. A codex is more like a book. They, they are sheets, and so they're the oldest books, you could say. This codex uh, dates from about the 4th century, so the year is 350 around, and it was recently discovered actually in the mid-1970s. And in the Middle East, there's always kind of new texts that are discovered, like, well, there are new old texts. There are texts that uh, have been hidden in, not hidden, but uh, just lost in monasteries. There are old monasteries, for example, that have libraries full of texts that nobody's bothered to go look at in a long, long time, and they're hidden somewhere in the bottom of a, you know, a, a box. And finally, when somebody pulls that out, they say, what in the world is this? They look at it. They don't understand it, so they put it back, you know, until somebody passes by and says, oh, my God, this is the, you know, a text that we haven't heard of in a long time and stuff like that. So uh, continually there are old texts that are being rediscovered, you could say. And this Codex Chacos was discovered in the mid-'70s. We're not sure when. 
because uh, what's going on in the Middle East right now with uh, all of these uh, fines is uh, there's a kind of a, a black market, and it's not clear who finds something, and it's sold here and it's sold there. Anyway, it ended up in uh, Switzerland, and then it ended up in, in New York, and it was put into a safety deposit box where it stayed for close to 20 years. And a safety deposit box isn't the best place to preserve a uh, text like that, you know, that's, uh, well, basically uh, 1,700 years old. So it deteriorated a lot. And by the time, uh, how can you say, decent people got onto it, and particularly the National Geographic Society was involved with it and invested in buying it and working on it, it's, it took five years of painstaking work to restructure the book because bits had crumpled off. And if you go on the website of the National Geographic Society, it's quite interesting to see how they managed to re to put the book back together. Okay, And so the Codex Chacos, and Chacos is the name of the guy who bought it, and that's why it's called the Codex Chacos. And now my computer goes into hibernation, so when I touch it, it doesn't do anything, you know? So come on, move along. So that's a codex discovered in the 1970s, and this codex contains uh, basically four texts. Uh, they are called Christian Gnostic writings, Gnostic writings. I'll come back to that, what are Christian Gnostic writings, but this is what they are. Um, the, the four texts, uh, one of them is called the First Apocalypse of James. Uh, another one is called the Letter of Peter to Philip. The third are fragments of... They've titled it right now the Book of Elogenes. And finally, the, the fourth one is the Gospel of Judas. So the, the one that has attracted the greatest attraction or attention is the Gospel of Judas. And why is that? Because we already have copies of the first Apocalypse of James and the letter of Peter to Philip. In 1945, there was a whole library that was unearthed in the Middle East called Nag Hammadi. And at Nag Hammadi in 1945, they discovered uh, dozens of codexes and manuscripts of um, texts that are uh, Christian Gnostic writings. And so they, in the discovery at Nag Hammadi in 1945, the first Apocalypse of James was in it, the letter of Peter to Philip was in it, but the Gospel of Judas wasn't. So this, this, uh, the Gospel of Judas is really, you could say, a find, a discovery. Now, it's not the first time we hear about a gospel of Judas. Saint Irenaeus, Saint Irenaeus was a bishop, uh, a bishop in Lyon, in France, uh, and in around the year 180, he wrote a long, long book, very, <laughs> very extensive. And in that book, he criticizes all sorts of various groups that call themselves Christian or purport to be. Christian, but he says are not. And a great number of these groups are what we call Gnostic groups. I'll come back to that. And so one of the things that Irenaeus does in his book is that he describes all these books. Uh, he's, he's managed to get his hand on, on them and he's read them. And basically what he does is he refutes them. You know, he says, now this book says that and that doesn't make any sense because... And this book says that, and that doesn't make any sense because. And then he says, and there's a book called The Gospel of Judas, was, was, which was written by a sect called the Canaanites. And these Canaanites, uh, what they do is they, uh, they uh, value people who, in the tradition, have been uh, seen as being very, uh, how can you say, tragic or negative uh, figures, like Cain, for example. You know, Cain slew Abel. So they call themselves the Cainites. So they, they follow Cain. And then they, they follow uh, figures that are kind of seen as negative, and one of them being Judas, and so they write a gospel of Judas. So Irenaeus speaks about this gospel of Judas and says, it's no good, you know? But uh, we've got Irenaeus' book criticizing the gospel of Judas, but we never had a copy of the gospel of Judas. So we didn't know what he was criticizing until... Now, because this book has been rediscovered. And that's why it's a very important discovery. You know, whenever you find an old book that somebody spoke about, but you, you, you had no copy of it, that's, that's extraordinary. We, we know, for example, and there's lots of books like that. We know, for example, 
uh, in one of Paul's letters, in the letter to the Corinthians, the second letter to the Corinthians, he speaks about another letter that he wrote to the Corinthians. Uh, a third letter. We don't have that letter. We wish we did, huh? But we don't have it. We, Paul speaks about it, but where is it? It's lost. In the Old Testament, often uh, when they talk about the kings, uh, uh, each time they end about the king, they said, the rest of his story is written down in uh, the Chronicles of the Kings. But where are the Chronicles of the Kings? We don't have that. That's lost. Um, we know that Aristotle wrote books that are lost. You know, So there are a lot of books from olden times that we don't have. This text of the Gospel of Judas is really a rediscovery. The original, uh, it's, it was written in Greek because St. Irenaeus was talking about a Greek text, but the one that we've discovered is not in Greek. It's in Coptic, which is an old Egyptian language. So it's a translation. So this book had been translated into old Egyptian, and that's what we have. It's an apocryphal Gnostic gospel. And I'll explain each of those words in a few moments, all right? It's the equivalent of six typed pages. That's how long it is. And I've got the, ta the pages here. This, this is it. This is the Gospel of Judas. It's that long. That's it. Not more than that. It's a short text. And, and the text, uh, just, just so that you kind of have an idea of what it's like, um, is not at all like the Gospels that we have. It tells very little of the story of Jesus' life. Very, very little. What it does is it presents the teachings of the Gnostic movement uh, in Jesus' mouth. You know? So it's much more, it's presented as dialogues. So here's the way it, it starts like this. The secret account of the revelation that Jesus spoke in conversation with Judas Iscariot during a week, three days before he celebrated Passover. So notice how it beginnings, the secret account of a revelation that Jesus spoke. That, and that's Gnosticism. See, two things. The Gnosticism is about something that's hidden and the master's going to teach you, but it's secret so you don't tell everybody. So, so it's, it's a secret knowledge. That's the whole idea behind Gnosticism. So it continues like this. When Jesus appeared on earth, and this is the summary of Jesus' life, when Jesus appeared on earth, he performed miracles and great wonders for the salvation of humanity. And since some walked in the way of righteousness while others walked in their transgressions, the twelve disciples were called. And he, speak, he began to speak to them about the mysteries beyond the world and what would take place at the end. See, that's Gnosticism. Gnosticism isn't concerned about this world. It's concerned, it's concerned about another world and how it all started and how it'll end and everything like that. And uh, often he did not appear to his disciples as himself, but he was found among them as a child. Now, that's a strange sentence, right? He was found among them as a child. But you have to know that in Gnosticism, a child is, is a, um, an image of someone who's not, who doesn't know the secret knowledge, while the, the mature person, the, the mature man, is the person who has all the secret knowledge. And as a matter of fact... Uh, somewhere else in one of the other Gnostic Gospels, it speaks about women who can become men. And, and you say, well, what does that mean, women who become men? It means women can learn the secret knowledge and become as wise as a full-grown man. You know, that's, that's the imagery that they use, okay? I'm not going to defend it, okay, folks? <laughs> And so anyway, there's, there's a, it starts with, as I note here, dialogue of Jesus with his disciples, you know. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read it all, but uh, when Jesus observed his disciples' lack of understanding, he said to them, why has this agitation led to your anger? Your God is within you and has provoked you to anger within your souls. Let anyone who is strong enough among human beings bring out the perfect human and stand before my face. You see, bring out the perfect human. There's, in Gnosticism, there's, there's a kind of a spark of the divine within us, and that's the perfect human. And if you can bring that perfect human out within you, then you can stand in the fullness of the revelation, see? 
But their spirits, it goes on, they all said, we have the strength. But their spirits did not dare to stand before him, except for Judas Iscariot. He was able to stand before him. And Judas said to him, I know who you are and where you have come from. You are from the immortal realm of Barbello. Oh, who is Barbello? <laughs> Barbello is in the Gnostic system. Uh, it's very difficult when you get into this Gnostic system. Sometimes they're called angels. Sometimes they're called aeons, uh, half-gods, uh, all sorts of kind of spiritual creatures. Uh, and, and so he's saying, you see, I know who you are, Jesus. You're from the realm of Barbello, from the realm of the gods, you know. And I am not worthy to utter the name of the one who has sent you. So knowing that Judas was reflecting upon something that was exalted, Jesus said to him, step away from the others and I shall teach you the mysteries of the kingdom. You see here, it's the whole idea that Jesus is the one who's going to initiate Judas into the secrets that nobody else knows, not the other 12. And, and so then what happens is that so there's the dialogue of Jesus with Judas. And so Jesus starts explaining to Judas, and I'll skip some parts here, but I'll give you an idea of some of the teaching of Jesus to Judas. Jesus, this is the teaching of Jesus. A great angel, the enlightened, self-generated, emerged from the cloud. Because of him, four other angels came into being from another cloud, and they became attendants for the angelic, self-generated. The self-generated said, let them come into being. And so he created the first luminary to reign over him. And he said, let angels come into being to serve this luminary. And myriads without number came into being. And he said, let an enlightened aeon come into being. And he came into being. He created the second luminary to reign over him, together with myriads of angels without number to offer service. That is how he created the rest of the enlightened aeons. He made them reign over them and he created for them myriads of angels without number to assist them. Adamus was in the first luminous cloud that no angel has ever seen among those called God. And I'll skip a bit. He made 72 luminaries appear in the incorruptible generation in accordance with the will of the Spirit. The 72 luminaries themselves made 360 luminaries appear in the incorruptible generation in accordance with the will of the Spirit that their number should be five for each. The twelve aeons of the twelve luminaries constitute their father with six heavens for each aeon, so that there are seventy-two heavens for the seventy-two luminaries, and for each of them five firmaments, for a total of three hundred and sixty firmaments. Are you getting all of this? I'll be preaching on this next Sunday. They were given authority in a great host of angels without number for glory and adoration and also that there are virgin spirits for glory and adoration of all the angels and the heavens and their firmaments. And then it goes on. Uh, and then let 12 angels come into being to rule over chaos and the underworld. And look, from the cloud there appeared an angel whose face flashed with fire and whose appearance was defiled with blood. His name was Nebro, which means rebel. Others called him Yaldaboath. Another angel, Sacklus, also came from the cloud. So Nebro created six angels, as well as Sacklus, to be assistants. And these produced 12 angels in the heavens, with each one receiving a portion in the heavens. The first of the lost angels is called Seth, who is also called Christ. The second is Harmathoth. The third is Galilah. The fourth is Yobel. The fifth is Adonaios. These are the five who rule over the underworld and over chaos. And then Sakla said to the angels, let us create a human being after the likeness and after the image. And they fashion Adam and Eve. You see, it's not God who's creating. It's angels who create, huh? Because in the Gnostic system, creation is bad. Creation is not good. Creation is a mistake. Um, and so they created Adam and Eve, for by this name all no generations shall know him. And then there, there's the destructive of the wicked. And, and finally, at the end of all of this long, very complicated discourse, uh, then, um, and then uh, Jesus said to Judas, look, what will those who have been baptized... No, Judas said to Jesus, what will those who have been baptized in your name do? Jesus said, I tell you, this baptism in my name... And then there are lines missing. And then he says to Judas, and I, I tell you, Judas, those who offer sacrifice 
to sackless, and then there are lines missing, everything that is evil. But you, speaking to Judas, will exceed them all, for you will sacrifice the man that clothes me. See, and, and, and that's, uh, that's the, the line that people are saying that Judas didn't betray Jesus, but Jesus asked Judas to sacrifice him because Jesus needed to be freed from his earthly body in order to rediscover unity with uh, the spark of the divine from which he had come, see? So you will sacrifice the man that clothes me. And then he goes on, uh, and then the image of the great, uh, lift up your eyes, uh, and he says, the star that leads the way among all the stars is your star, Judas. And Judas lifted up his eyes, and he saw the luminous cloud, and he entered it. And then the high priests murmured because Jesus had gone into the guest room for his prayer. They approached Judas and said to him, what are you doing there? You are Jesus' disciple. And Judas, Judas answered them as they wished, and he received some money, and he handed him over to them. The end of the Gospel of Judas. Okay, so you see that the Gospel of Judas has very little um, story to tell, very little story to tell, just Jesus talks with the disciples and then he, he says, those who can face me, face me, and none of them can except Judas. So he takes Judas aside and then he initiates Judas into the mysteries. But these are the mysteries of the Gnostic uh, philosophy and it goes on for a few pages. And at the end, he says to Judas, and so you will deliver me of this body, you will sacrifice the exterior man, and so at the end Judas takes the money and that's the end of the story. And, and, and this is the gospel of Judas, all right? I said that the gospel of Judas fits into what are called apocryphal Gnostic texts. So let's start with the first word, apocrypha. Apocrypha are non-canonical texts that are similar to Scripture in many ways. Non-canonical means they are not in the canon of Scriptures. If you buy a Bible, you will not find them in the Bible. All right? There are other texts that were written at the same time as the Bible. There are Old Testament apocrypha. There are, there are texts from the Jewish tradition that are not in the Jewish Bible. They're not in our Old Testament. Uh, most of those texts were written in maybe the hundred years before the time of Jesus or the hundred years after the time of Jesus, during that 200-year period. There are a number of texts that were written that were not kind of considered part of the scriptures. Um, I, I'll give you, those of you who remember the old, Dies ire, dies ila, solvet seclum in fabila, Cum teste David, cum sibil. I'm getting the words mixed up. But those who remember that from the old Latin funeral mass, it says, Dies sire, dies la day of wrath that day. Teste David, cum sibila, as David and the Sibyl spoke of them, of that last day. There would be a day of wrath. David is who? David is King David, so the book of Psalms. Sibyl is the Sibylline oracles which are not a book in the Bible. They are an apocryphal Old Testament text. They, they, they are Jewish. They, they resound with Jewish themes. They were written during the time of Scripture, but they never were accepted into Scripture. So in that hymn, that old hymn, they, they're quoting the Sibylline oracles. That's one example of many examples, maybe 20 or 30 books that we know that would be Old Testament Apocrypha. And then there's New Testament Apocrypha. New Testament Apocrypha, I'm talking about books that were written that look like Scripture, at least they have a title that sounds like Scripture, but were never accepted into uh, the Bible. And in the New Testament Apocrypha, uh, written from the 2nd to the 7th century uh, of our era, we count 22 Gospels, 15 Acts of the Apostles, 10 Epistles, 6 Apocalypses. <laughs> All right? So, so you'll have things like the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Bartholomew, 
You'll have 15 Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of Peter, the Acts of Paul, the Acts of Thecla, the Acts of James, the Acts of, uh, well, name practically all the, 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 the Apostles. Each one has a, a book of Acts written for him. Ten Epistles, the third Epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, uh, the third letter of Peter, the letter of uh, Peter to Philip, the letter of uh, Paul to somebody else, you know, so a bunch of letters. Six apocalypses, the first apocalypse of James, the second apocalypse of James, the apocalypse of Isaiah, you know, all these books. Now, they all have titles that sound like books of the gospel, right? But they're not. They were written from the year 100 to the year 600, by people who either wanted to expand the Gospels because there are parts missing, or they they wanted to put their theories and place them in the words of the apostles or in the words of Jesus to give some authority to their text, you know? So if if I've thought of a good thought and I, I want to convince others of it, but uh, I'm not very well known. They'll say, well, who are you to say that? And I say, well, I got this from the Pope. The Pope said this. Oh, well, if the Pope said that, it must be right. Are you going to go check? (laughs) You know? So this was... What happened there? Are we back on? So so the question... One, two, three, four, five, six. We've got a little problem here. Are we okay? We lost... uh, We lost some bass and I've got some feedback. We'll try for the sound. I'll try not to move too much. Um, so so these these texts of the, the Apocrypha were there are all, there are three basic kinds. And on the last line there are the three kinds are written. There are Christian Apocrypha, there are Judeo Christian Apocrypha, and there are Gnostic Apocrypha. Christian Apocrypha are are books that were written by Christians, usually for um, a very how can you say, uh, for devotion, for, um, I, I, how can you, I'll give you an example. The, the Gospel of James, it's called the Gospel of James or the Proto-Gospel of James the, because this is the, it's a text that focuses on the story of Jesus as a little baby, you know, because the Gospels don't tell us much, right? So people say, I wonder what happened to Jesus, you know, when he was seven years old and eight and nine years old. And, and then, you know, there was a devotion to Mary that was growing. So I wonder what happened to Mary before the angel talked to her. And so they, they kind of invent a whole life of Mary before the angel talks to her. And they, they invent stories about Jesus. Now, maybe some of these stories were stories that had been invented somewhere else and they were kind of handed on so that people were talking about them. And the person who wrote it down thought it was true. He thought it was a true story, but it got invented somewhere. And, and maybe some, some facts are indeed facts, but it's very hard for us today to kind of separate. So, for example, um, the, the story of the, the proto-gospel of James says that Mary was born of an old man and an old woman named uh, Anne and uh, Joachim. That's where we get the names of the parents of Mary. We don't get in that in the Bible. It's not written in the Bible. It's written in the proto-gospel of James. Is it true? I don't know. All I know is we have a feast of Joachim and and St. Anne, right? In the Catholic Church. Well, hopefully that's their names, but if not, we're celebrating the parents of Mary anyway, whoever, whatever their names were. But we got that from the proto-gospel. That's where that story comes from. Or the idea that Mary was brought to the temple and consecrated at the age of 12 years old, which is absolutely impossible in the Jewish tradition. It's absolutely impossible. That, that story can't be true. But it's in the proto-gospel of James, and so it's kind of circulated. And, and the artists in the Middle Ages, in, you know, they got influenced by that. So you have paintings of old uh, uh, Anne and old uh, Joachim, you know, going, going with Mary and presenting her at, as a little child to the temple. So, so, so these stories kind of entered the, the Christian heritage, you could say, became known through paintings and through stories and through plays and things like that. Th- those are apocrypha. They're not part of our faith. They're wonderful stories. Some of them are pretty, 
I would say you don't want to believe them. Like, you don't want to believe the story about the kid who tripped Jesus by accident and Jesus killed him right there. Well, did, Jesus didn't do it on purpose. The kid just died, you know. Uh, it's in the proto-gospel of James. You don't want to believe that, okay? You know, but it's in there. It, the proto-gospel of James, I think, is 4th century. So, so this is 400 years after the time of Jesus. It's literature. It's literature of that time. You could call it devout fiction, you know. The, yeah, yeah. So, so okay. So that's Christian Apocrypha. Then you have Judeo-Christian Apocrypha, which, which are texts. Now, among the Jewish people uh, who received the message of Jesus, some of them didn't accept um, some of the innovations that the Christians were bringing in, particularly Paul. You know, and there was a big debate around this, huh? Uh, does a Christian have to follow all the laws of the Old Testament? There was a huge debate about this. And finally, Paul, in the letter to the Galatians, we see it. He goes to Jerusalem. There's a big conference, and they agree that, no, you don't have to be, you, know, you don't have to follow the rules of the Old Testament in order to be a Christian. Particularly, you don't have to be circumcised. Well, some of those who were attracted to Jesus didn't agree with that. They felt that you, you had to remain faithful to the rules of the Old Testament. So there was a, a kind of a fringe group that we could call the Judeo-Christians. And some of the Apocrypha, a few texts, are Judeo-Christian in that sense, that they reflect those environments, environments where people were interested in following Jesus but felt you had to hold on to the, all the rules of the Old Testament. So there are a few texts. And then we have the Gnostic Christian texts, and there are quite a few of those. What is Gnosticism? Gnosticism is a kind of a, it's a blanket term for various religious groups and sects that were most prominent just around the time of Jesus or after in the first and the second century, mostly in the Greek-speaking world. Mostly in the Greek-speaking world. Now, uh, many elements that we find in second century Gnosticism they, they're older than the time of Jesus. They predate Christianity. Some of the stuff dates from the 1st, the 2nd, and the 3rd century before Christ. Some of it is, is connected with um, religions that existed in Persia, for example. The name of Gnosticism comes from a Greek word, gnosis. Gnosis means uh, knowledge. Gnosis means knowledge. And so Gnosticism is refers to the fact that in all these sects and groups, uh, what is special is the idea that there's a knowledge that the great majority of people don't have, but you as an initiate, you can discover this knowledge. That's the part of Gnosticism. So you will, you will be special, you will have the knowledge, and this knowledge will somehow set you free. Now, free from what? Uh, let me just, I want to read a few of the basic thoughts of Gnosticism. Gnostic beliefs. Gnosticism generally teaches that matter, matter, the created matter, is evil, that it is not the will of God. Um, and as a matter of fact, it was not created by God, but by a, a half-God. That God created a being, and that being was not a good being, and often that secondary God in the Gnostic circles is called Yahweh. So is identified with the God of the Old Testament. So that agnostic Christian like Marcion said that all the books of the Old Testament were to be condemned. See, he, he refused all the books of the Old Testament because he says those books, they follow Yahweh and Yahweh is a bad God. Huh? So that's Gnosticism. Um, the Demiurge was the head of what was called archons, petty rulers, craftsmen of the physical world. But they felt that human bodies, though their matter is evil, they contain a divine spark within them that fell from the true God. Somehow a divine spark fell into the true God. And that knowledge, that gnosis, will enable the true spark to return to the real God. That, that's the idea behind gnosis. That, that what you see is evil, it's no good, but within each one of us there's kind of a part of God and if we have the right knowledge, then that we're going to be able to 
liberate that spark of God within us to return to God. And basically the way to do that is to kind of not give in to any uh, needs of the body. And so Gnosticism often fell into very serious ascetical forms where people stopped eating, stopped drinking, stopped walking, stopped talking, uh, stopped uh, all human activity basically in order to free the human spark. Either that or they went into the other extreme where they said, well, since the body is nothing, you can do with it what you want. And they engaged in orgies and stuff like that, since it didn't really matter anyway. That's an interesting religion. <laughs> Many Gnostics, especially the followers of one Gnostic teacher called Valentinius, taught that there was the one original unknowable God, and that from that one emerged aeons or pairs of lesser beings. The aeons together make up the fullness of God and the lowest of these pairs is Sophia and Christos, wisdom and Christ. And in the Gnostic creation myth, Sophia sought God, but he was distant from her. So she saw a distant light, which was in fact her image, and she got fooled and so she got away even more from God. So just as she lost the sight of the one God, it caused confusion and longing. And because of these longings, matter and soul accidentally came into existence through the four elements of fire, water, earth, and air. And, and so this is the, the creation, the mistaken creation of the world. Um, and after this, the Christ then comes back and lets the Sophia wisdom see the light again, bringing her knowledge of the spirit so Christ then is sent to earth in the form of the man Jesus to give human beings the knowledge they need to rescue themselves from the physical world and return to the spiritual world. There are three types, three sensations experienced by Sophia create three types of humans. Humans who are bonded to matter, who are evil. Humans who are bonded to the soul and so are partly saved from evil. And humans who are bonded to the spirit or to the the kind of divine, divine spark in them, then they can behold the world of light. And the, the Gnostics felt they were of that third group. Anyway, that, that's kind of the, the image of um, the thought of the, the Gnostic sects. And as I say, when you read uh, some of the Gnostic texts, you can read pages and pages and pages, and it's all like it sounded, you know, numbers of angels and numbers of heavens and, and also, and really I... Uh, I must admit, I have trouble in seeing how that can help me come to relationship with God and find the divine spark. But anyway, that was what Gnosticism was. And since it was a very popular current in Gnosticism, it infiltrated into the Christian church, and so there were Christian Gnostics. They, they were Gnostics with a Christian cover, you know, uh, wolf in sheep's clothing. So these texts, these Gnostic texts, are, call themselves gospels or epistles or apocalypses, but really they're not. What they are is they take the shape of a gospel or an apocalypse or of a letter, but basically what they want to do is not put forward the teaching of Christ, but put forth the teaching of the Gnostics. And that's what we call the, uh, the Gnostic gospels. Excuse me. So the question is, well, when did we know what was in the Bible and what was not in the Bible? And, and that's a good question. What we call the canon of Scripture. Canon, a canon means, uh, in Greek, a rule. It means a rule, a regulation. That's what a canon is. In, in the Catholic Church, we speak about canon law. Why do we call it canon law? It's just the rules for the governing of the church, just rules. So the canon of scripture is the rule of scripture. What is, what is the rule that says which books are in, which books are out? Well, in the Catholic Church, uh, in the West, when, and I say the Catholic Church, and this was before the Reformation. So in the history of the, the Christian Church in the West, the first time that there was an official rule that was set, look at the last line, was in 1443 at the Council of Florence. That, that gave us, that said, this is the Bible. These are the books of the Bible, you know. Now, what's interesting is in that list of the books of the Bible, it included, for example, books of the Old Testament whose original language was in Greek. 
and that the Jews themselves do not consider part of the Old Testament. And when Luther came around, Luther decided that those books should not be included in the Bible. So he took them out, which is why the list of books in a Protestant Bible is not exactly the same as in the Catholic Bible. Basically, it's a few books of the Old Testament whose original language was Greek. They're not, they're not very important books. You know, it's, that's not what the difference between Catholicism and Protestantism falls on, those few books, okay? They're, they're generally secondary books. But, uh, but it's remarkable that the rule was only established in 1443. What, what, what really happened was basically uh, over the course of centuries, major churches, when I talk about major churches, when we're talking about the first, second, and third century, we're talking about the Church of Alexandria in Egypt, the Church of Antioch in Palestine, the Church of Constantinople in what is now Turkey, and, and, and the Church of Rome in Italy, those were the, the, and the Church of Jerusalem, those were the patriarchs that were there. They were the major churches at the beginning of, of the church's history, and, and the various other churches kind of felt themselves tied to those major churches. So whatever was read in those major churches was read in the secondary churches, you could say. And so as those churches decided, as the bishops of those churches decided, well, we sh this we should read, that we shouldn't read. And basically the question was, where do we read it? In the liturgy. Do we read it in the liturgy? Do we read it when we get together to pray? You know, that was the rule. So is it included in the liturgy or not? And so the fact that books were used by the major churches became a sign that the book was okay to be used. What's noticeable is that all the books that eventually were kind of adopted by these five churches were all written in the first century. They were all from the time of Jesus or in the 60 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. They were all, no books from the second, third, fourth, and fifth century, which is where all the Apocrypha are written, were ever accepted. Only the early books were accepted. And why? Because they are written by those who knew Jesus, who were close to Jesus. The apostles, first of all, or someone like Mark, who was close to the apostle Peter, or Luke, who was close to the apostle Paul. You see, so, so the fact is that it had to kind of come from that first generation of Christians. If it was written by the second generation of Christians, no. They, they, they could be good books, they could be books that you know, enlightened us and taught us and helped us, but they were not to be read in the liturgy, they were not considered scripture. And, and finally, a, a third criteria was that they had to have some kind of cohesion in the theology. You know, they had to hang together. That's why the book of James, kind of it took a while for the book of James, the letter of James, to be accepted. Because the letter of James seems to be in, con in contradiction to Paul's letters sometimes, particularly in the question of the relationship between faith and good works, you know. Because what Paul was saying, it's not our works that save us, it's our faith in Jesus. And James says, well, it's very nice to have faith, but if you don't have works, your faith isn't worth anything. You know, you say, I'll, I have faith, I'll say, show me the works that show you have faith, kind of thing, right? So, so James was seen by some to be in contradiction with Paul, so they said, well, we shouldn't take that, we shouldn't take that. But slowly they said, no, 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 it's not in contradiction, it's in completion, and we have to hold both together. And so James was kept in the canon. So, so slowly the, 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 the canon was clarified. In, in the year 367, Athanasius, who was patriarch of Alexandria, which was one of the major churches, St. Athanasius, Athanasius, he wrote a list of the books that were used in his church, and the list is exactly the list that we have now. You know? But it took a while for that list to be kind of, to, to establish itself. But I can tell you one thing. In all the churches, never was agnostic text, in all the major churches, never was agnostic text accepted as part of text to be read in uh, the liturgy. Never. Those texts were always marginal, always considered marginal. All right? Hang in there, folks. We're coming to the end of the presentation. So we come to the Da Vinci Code. Now, Dan Brown starts his book. How many have read the Da Vinci Code? Can I see? I see about two-thirds of you, huh? 
Um, it's, a, it's a kind of an airport book. You know, you know what I mean? It's the kind of book you read in an airport while you're waiting for your plane because the chapters are very short. They're only three or four pages, so you can stop whenever you feel like it. And each chapter always ends. He's very good. It always ends with kind of a, it's, it's like, you know, Dallas. There's always what's going to happen next episode, you know, huh? right? So, so you're kind of always wanting to go forward. I'm showing my age. I'm talking about Dallas. <laughs> All the young people here are saying, what's he talking about, you know? So, you know, so, um, so it's, it, and it's, it's a kind of, it's a strange, but well, anyway, it's an airport fiction book. Um, he starts by saying, uh, all the documents and rituals described here are true. In this book are true. He says this is a work of fiction, but all the documents are true. Well, technically, yes, all the documents are true. true. But the problem with the book is all the theories that are built around the documents are false. See? What he does is he builds up all sorts of false theories around those documents. So, for example, he'll speak about, uh, and I'll come back to that, the Gospel of Mary, which is a Gnostic text. There is a book called the Gospel of Mary. That's true, and he's right. But then he says it was written before the other Gospels. That's not true. There is a true document, but what he's, the theory he puts out is false. It's as if somebody, it's as if somebody was writing a book saying, on the shores of the St. Lawrence River, there is a town called Cornwall. And in um, 1750, there was a massacre where 50,000 uh, Mohawks were killed by the white uh, uh, colonists. Well, anybody who knows the history of Cornwall says, that's not true. And you'd say to Dan Brown, that's not true. Oh, I just said the city was true. There is a city of Cornwall. Isn't that right? You say, yeah, that's all I'm saying is true. The rest is fiction. And this is where people get mixed up. They think the theories are true because he says that it's true. But it's not. See, he's, he's, yes, it's true that there is a gospel of Mary, but his theories along with it are not. Now, there's a lot in the, in, in the Da Vinci Code, his theories about uh, Leonardo da Vinci and his theories about the Priori de Sion and his theories about... Uh, uh, you know, uh, goddess religion and everything. And I, I, I'm not going to go into that. I mean, that's a whole other conference. I'm sticking to the question of the Gnostic Gospels because he uses the Gnostic Gospels. Particularly, he uses the Gospel of Mary. Now, the first thing you have to remember, it's a Gnostic Gospel, so it's not a real Gospel, and it was written late. Contrary to what he says, it was not written before the Gospels, and it wasn't kicked out because all of a sudden somebody didn't like Mary Magdalene decided to kick her book out. No, it was never recognized as a book that was faithful to the teaching of Jesus. What's interesting about that book is in the same way that the Gospel of Judas opposes Judas to the disciples, here who's being opposed? Mary Magdalene to the disciples. And in the same way that Judas receives special knowledge in this Gospel, who gets special knowledge? Mary Magdalene gets the special knowledge. It was written in the second century. But you see how it's a Gnostic text. It's the same text, practically, as the book of Jude, as the Gospel of, uh, of um, uh, Judas. Only here, instead of Judas being the hero, it's Mary Magdalene. Well, you can't have both being true, right? Either Judas is a special disciple or Mary Magdalene is. Which one is true? Let's ask Dan Brown. <laughs> the fact is they're both Gnostic texts, and, and they're not. So the thing that you have to remember when reading Dan Brown's novel or when going to see the movie, when you go see the movie, is that the Gnostic Gospels were not written first, okay? which is said in the novel. They were not written first. The Gospels we have were written first. The Gospels we have, Mark, Matthew, uh, Luke, John a bit later, maybe the end of the first century. But, but the other three are dated around the year 65 to 80. All right, so 30 years, 40 years, 50 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, when the memory of Jesus is very much alive, of the historical Jesus, is very much alive in the minds of the communities where these books are being written, not 100 and 200 years later, when they're being written by people whose philosophy is completely different from the teachings of Jesus. What's remarkable is that the Gospel of Mary, 
You can go read it. You can go on the web and find a, sign, a, a website. The Gospel of Mary does not imply that Mary and Jesus were married, which is at the heart of his book. I don't want to ruin the book for you, but <laughs> those of you who haven't read it, I'm sorry, I'm going to tell you. You know, his thesis that Mary and J Jesus had a baby, you know, and that baby was transported to France. And eventually his son became another son whose son whose son whose son became the first king of France. And, and, uh, and the kings of France are really the descendants of Jesus Christ. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> and this, oh, I, it's so. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I have to say, I find it so ridiculous. But people are getting caught up with it. It's the funniest thing. But it, the, the, gospel, the gospel of Mary doesn't imply that they were married, never claims that Mary had a child. And on the contrary, Gnosticism rejected sexuality and marriage because the body's bad. This material reality is bad. So Gnosticism would never... The Gnostics, if you had told them that Mary and Jesus had had sex, the Gnostics would have gone, oh! you know, even, even more than us. So this can't be part of the Gnostic tradition. See, see this is where the, the story falls apart. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But it's important that you know that he's using the Gnostic Gospels. Now, in conclusion, what can I say then? Um, well, the first thing I think is that the Da Vinci Code forces us, believers, to be more mature in our faith and to be better informed in our faith. Uh, you know, for example, this whole question of the Gnostic Gospels. Most of us don't know about it, don't know how these texts were written, where they come from. Most of us don't know how the Bible was written. All we know is we have the Bible and we can quote it, but, you know, we're a bit like people who drive a car. We know how to start the motor and get it from here to there, step on the gas, and don't step on the brake at the same time, you know. But if you step on the gas and nothing happens, you think there's something wrong with the motor, well, then you say, I, I, I have no idea what to do. Bring it to a technician. Bring it to a mechanic, right? So, so often we're the same way in our faith. We kind of, well, we got the Bible. Yeah, I got the Bible, you know, and I read it. And, but how it was written, how it developed, uh, what's the relationship between those texts and other texts, uh, who decided that this book would remain, and why did they decide that it remained within the Bible? Those issues we've never really thought about. And, and maybe this is a gift of Dan Brown's book is that it forces us to ask those questions. And in forcing us to ask those questions, it's bringing us to a more mature stand in our faith. I, I remember the time I came back from seminary once and, uh, you know, uh, we, were, we were studying the Gospels. And at one point, you know, I, started, I said to my, my parents, you know, I said, oh, well, there's this and there's that and there's this question, that question, that question. I remember my mother saying to me, oh, don't ask those questions, you know. You'll, you'll lose your faith. And I said, well, if my faith can't handle the questions that I have, then it's not a faith worth having. You know, let us not be scared to ask the questions. Now, my, now I come home and my mother's asking me all the questions, you know. It's <laughs> but there's one thing about, about the, uh, the, this whole phenomenon of the Da Vinci Code. And I, th I think there's something in there that there's an anti-Catholic sentiment that's out there. You know, it's not very articulate and it doesn't but it's it's kind of there and and when you look for it you see it you see it in articles you see it in cartoons you see it in plays you see it in books it's it's out there you know and that anti-catholic sentiment i think his book latches on to that and it presents spurious theory as fact leading to anxiety among many less well-educated catholics and christians so it's important that that we inform ourselves it's important that we read and that we study and that we discuss this and that, and that we share our discoveries with others, you know, that we tell them, look, you know, this and that and that and that, all right? So just to let you know, there are a number of books that have been written that kind of uh, uh, address a lot of these issues. For example, there's a, a book here called The Da Vinci Deception, um, and at the Little uh, Angels Family uh, Bookshop also, you can get a book called The Da Vinci Code, A Quest for Answers, or The Da Vinci Code Breaker. This one, The Da Vinci Code De Deception, I think you can get at uh, uh, the Centre d'Information Catholique, Catholic Information Center behind the Co-Cathedral. 
Oh, and there, it'll be on sale at the back. Sorry. Is there somebody at the back there? Oh, there you go. How much are you selling them for? Six ninety-five, seven bucks. Keep the change. You know. <laughs> so, the other thing I want to let you know is there's an excellent website. If you go on the web, there's an excellent website of the USCCB, the U.S. Uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops, called Jesus Rediscovered. I think that's what it's called. Dot com. Triple W dot Jesus Rediscovered dot com. And basically what it does is addresses a number of the aspects of the Da Vinci Code and goes into greater detail in what the, the facts are behind that, okay? Um, yeah, so at this time... So there are two DVDs that I'm told that are very good. Okay, so two DVDs called Beyond the Da Vinci Code and The Real Da Vinci Code. So, so there's a lot of material out there to help you reflect and to help you understand. But I think the most important thing to do is not just, you know, kind of cast it off. It's to go study, to go look at it, to go reflect on it, you know. For example, in Da Vinci Code, one last comment before we just can't stand the stretch. In the Da Vinci Code, there's a, there's a, a comment that... Uh, it was Constantine, the emperor of Rome, who called together a synod and forced the bishops of the synod to declare that Jesus was divine. And that was the beginning of the belief that Jesus was divine. Well, I, I'm sorry, but that's BS, <laughs> to use a polite word. Okay? Already in, in, in Scripture, there, there are clear indications that Scripture considers Jesus to be divine, both 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 God and man. It's already in Scripture. And within the first century, there were clear statements of that belief. So it was not Constantine the emperor who decided to do that in order to conquer those his enemies who happened to be pagan. All right? So things like that are statements that it's important for us to be able to, to know what the truth is on that. Okay? So it's five to eight. And uh, now there are a lot of us here. So we're not going to be able to walk around. Uh, I would just invite you to kind of stand up and just stretch where you are for two, three minutes, okay? And, and the first question has just been asked of me. The question is, what is the Da Vinci Code? <laughs> and just for those who don't know, the Da Vinci Code is a novel that was published uh, two years ago now, three years ago. And three years ago, thank you, it, and w is now being made into a movie, and uh, it's uh, and and the, the the idea is why Da Vinci is involved in it is supposedly Da Vinci was one of the grand masters of a sect that was supposed to keep the secret knowledge about the daughter or sons of Jesus, you know, being the kings of France and everything. So, so that's why it's called that way. Anyway, so there you go. Um, by the way, uh, in, in that book, there, there, there's so many things. You know, For example, in the book, there's a place where a, a clue is um, a, a gold uh, disc in the floor of a church, you know, and that's a clue. And that clue has been there since the 14th century, these gold discs, and they trace the meridian zero. But actually, those gold discs, and if you go into the church of... Uh, Saint um, Sulpice in France. The, the disc is there, absolutely. It's in the floor. But what it is is uh, it's a work of art uh, from the 1970s, I believe, by a sculptor who decided that he was going to place these discs, and he had thought of doing it along the the, the line which used to be the line zero, the meridian zero in Paris, but he couldn't find enough famous buildings along that that line, so he kind of invented his own line and he placed these discs a bit everywhere around Paris in the 1970s. It has nothing to do with the 14th century. and uh, but, but see, he uses that, and, and so he'll say, well, yes, those disks exist. Well, yes, they exist, but they're not part of a secret code that's existed for hundreds of years in order to decipher this mystery. You know, So that's how the whole book is. And, and the funny thing is Mary Magdalene's tomb is supposed to be in the Louvre, you know, well, uh, you know, it seems that tourists go, you know, to this little pyramid looking for her, you know, and so the, the guards have to say, no, she's not buried here, you know. It's <laughs> anyway, so that's, so question somebody had, yes. 
Opus Dei is, uh, Opus Dei, uh, you're, you're practically tempted to say it's a religious order in the church. The, the best thing we can think of is a religious order, but it's not a religious order. It's, it's an association of men and women who are following the teachings of, uh, of, of a Spanish priest of this century. Uh, and uh, basically his teaching was about how to, uh, to lead a holy life in the midst of the world. So it's the whole contrary of Gnosticism <laughs> because it's in the midst of our world, in the work that we do in raising a family, how we develop holiness. And so that association called Opus Dei, it includes priests, but, in, but the majority of members are lay, men and women, married couples uh, who belong to it, who commit themselves to a rule of life. Um, now, Opus Dei was founded in, uh, uh, in the 1930s, 40s, um, and, and so some of the devotions that are still alive in Opus Dei are, are devotions that were found more frequently before uh, the Second Vatican Council. So, for example, mortification of the flesh, you know, so to, for me, you, I was taught mortification of the flesh is a cold shower, you know, that, that was about it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, 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 but, but back before the Second Vatican Council, it was a bit more strict than that, you know. So there was, uh, there, there's the practice of wearing a, a sinis, we call it in French, which is a, a band with a few barbs that prick the skin and just make it uncomfortable to sit or to move around. And so it's just a reminder of the pain of Jesus on the cross. It's it just little things that make us uncomfortable. It's not masochism. Da Vin uh, Dan Brown presents it as masochism. It is not. Um, it, it's kind of strange for us to hear about it because we don't hear about it, but there, there are groups that practice various forms of mortification of the body, you know, just to remind us that um, not that the body is bad, but the body should not rule, you know. So th that's Opus Dei. And Opus Dei, I guess, uh, there's an excellent book if you want to read about Opus Dei written by uh, John Allen, who's a reporter for the National Catholic Reporter. It's just been published about six months ago. I've read it. It is excellent. It's called Opus Dei, uh, uh, John Allen, and it is an excellent book, and it's very, very balanced. And uh, I'm friends with the regional director of Opus Dei here in Canada, Monsignor Ta, uh, Fred Dolan, and uh, who's a good, good man, you know. So, so that's Opus Dei. The Knights Templar was a religious order of men uh, who um, were founded in the Middle Ages, basically to accompany pilgrims who went to the Middle East because there was so much violence and possibility of being robbed and uh, beaten to death. They, they, they formed, it was a religious order really of knights. It was knights who decided to dedicate themselves to protecting pilgrims. But what happened with the Knights Templar is that uh, because they were all along that route, uh, people rather than carrying money along with them, what they would do is when they left, say, Paris, they would entrust it to the Knights Templar, their money. The Knights Templar would write to them, give them a, a document saying, we have this money which is yours here. And when they got to Jerusalem, they went to the Knights Templar and they would say, well, you know, uh, this money, the Knights Templar have it in Paris. So they would give them that money back. So it was the first banking system. And, and uh, it was the first banking system before any banks were established. Well, of course, what happens is that some people die along the way, so the money was never claimed, and so the Knights Templar got wealthy. You know, it became a wealthy order. Now, uh, they were also a powerful order, and they got on the wrong side of some kings and some popes who eventually shut them down. And, uh, and now there are all sorts of stories. Again, you're in the Middle Ages. So the last, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's a true story that the last uh, director general of the Knights Templar uh, was accused of heresy, and like they did back then to heretics, they burned them at the stake. And as he was burning, looking at the at the king in France, he he cursed the king of France, and he said, "And this curse will lie on you and on your children." You know. And what happened was that the king died within a year, and his three kids who reigned after him all died within a year. And within six years, there were the the line was dead, and a uh, new. So people go, ooh. <laughs> so that's the story of the Knights Templar, you know. And then the Priori de Sion is an invention of um, uh, a strange guy in the uh, uh, 1950s 
who forged documents that looked like medieval documents. We know they're forgeries now, but he built up this, this strange secret society which never existed, but, uh, but Dan Brown uses that in order to connect with you know, the, the Knights Templar and stuff like that. So those are the three organizations in, in the book. Of the three, Opus Dei exists, and it's a good, solid organization. Yes? Yeah, the, he, he doesn't, no, there's nothing original in his book, you know, everything he's written is in other books before, certainly not by scholars, you know, like, like there's another book, I mean, the guy sued him, huh, you know, for Holy Blood and Holy Grail. I remember reading Holy Blood, Holy Grail 15 years ago. I was intrigued by it, this notion that a son of Mary and, uh, and Jesus uh, became the, 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 the head of the line of the kings of France and all of that. I remember reading that. I mean, it's, again, I, I mean, it's not a scholar that wrote that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's fringe stuff. It's not taught in a single university in the world, you know. So, but then Brown uses all of those things, and he builds his novel. So there's nothing new in Dan's Brown, in Dan Brown's stuff. But uh, to say that um, he... He, he's completely innocent of the theories. I, I was on his website just before coming. And, and um, basically he says, well, I, I do believe that the Gnostic Gospels contain the real interpretation of who Jesus was about. You know, so, yep. Were all the Knights Templar killed on the, uh, that, last, you know, that, that last group, you mean, who were? I, I don't know. I, I don't know if they were killed on Friday the 13th or not. <laughs> And I don't know if Friday the 13th became a superstition because of that or if it came later. Yes. Well, yeah, there, there's, I, I mean, l l let's face it. I, when you're talking about the Middle Ages, you're talking about great intrigues of power between various different groups. Uh, when you think about King Henry VIII, for example, uh, you know, who declared separation from uh, the Church of, of Rome, you have to remember that one of his objectives was to nationalize the property of the religious orders in England at the time who owned about a third of the land in England. The, a third of the land in England at the time of Henry VIII belonged to the religious orders. All of that was expropriated by Henry VIII. So, so there's a lot of economics, power, uh, and stuff going on at the same time. Um, when Louis IX uh, brought the crusade against the Cathars, uh, in the south of France, it, it, was con it was considered the one religious crusade within France against a sect within France. But at the end, the end result was that he unified France. Uh, you know, what is now France, he made that one country. So the question is, did he do it out of religious motivation or did he do it out of political motivation to expand his territory? It's a good question for historians to debate. You didn't hear that at the back. She says, she says, I can't even pronounce the word Gnostic. It sounds like something on the menu at Philo's. <laughs> so, so I understand your question. So your question is, take John's Gospel. And John's Gospel and the Book of Revelation are the two books that were the latest books, the last books chronologically that made it into Scripture. And there are possibly some Gnostic texts that were written at the same time. So obviously, the, 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 the cutoff point is not just the question of when it was written, okay? That's not the only cut. I'm saying it's one of the criteria, that it was written in the first century, or at least uh, close enough to the first century that it is tied. And, and you're right, the final version of all the Gospels were probably not finalized by the disciples themselves. Matthew probably did not finalize the last version of Matthew's Gospel. John did not finalize the last version of John's Gospel. But what is clear is that there, th those apostles were tied intimately to the community where the final version was given. So for example, John, there's a Johannine community that that Johannine community lived of the teaching of John, you know. And so the, the final version of it, who put the last, you know, put the last dot at the, at, well, there were no dots, but the last letter, you know, uh, who put that in, who knows for sure. But the thing that we do know is that by the years 120, 130, that text was being proclaimed as uh, an accepted text within the liturgy of the major churches, you know. And, and the reason was because of the link with John and the clear link with John, and secondly, because of what I was speaking of, the cohesion 
of the text with the rest of the received body. Another text that might have been written at the same time, for example, the Gospel of Judas, might have been written close to the same time. But the Gospel of Judas was obviously not ascribed to a community. Judas left no community. So there's no believing community there to carry that. And the, the message is so contradictory with the rest of Scripture that it's obvious that it is not inspired. And so that book is not read. You know, and so th that's how slowly the canon formed, the, the 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 internal coherence and the attachment of the text to a to an apostle and to an apostle's community. That's those are the criterion. So it's hard for us to to clarify clearly because a lot of that time our our knowledge of the history of the early Christian communities is very poor. You know, there were no there were no reporters from the Standard Freeholder. In, in Ephesus to write us a column every day to to let us know what was going on at night, you know. So so so, but, but that's the best that we can tell, you know, that that those texts were chosen because of the coherence, because of the attachment and the bond to one of the apostles who is linked directly to Jesus. Irenaeus, for example, Irenaeus, uh, who wrote in the year 180, we know studied with the disciple of John. You see, we know those connections, you know. So here's Irenaeus studying with a disciple of John. So when he is commenting on these Gnostic texts, you know that he stands right in the tradition of the apostles, you know, handed right down. Um, if I can give an example, uh, an image that I use often, and because it's a really important question, because the question is, why is the Bible the Bible? Well, that's, that's the question ultimately. Why is the New Testament the New Testament? My grandmother, when, when my granddad passed away, I remember going to my grandmother's. And this, this is on my, my mom's side, my tante. <laughs> my grandmother, so, so my grandmother, at one point during the evening, she pulled out a box, and it was a box full of pictures. All right? So we're, we're going through the pictures. We're going through the pictures. And, um, but the pictures by themselves, it's hard. Well, here's two guys standing in front of the car, but... Who are the two guys? What's the car? You know, my grandmother takes her and says, Ah, oh, look, this is, you know, uh, your your grandfather's cousin, and this is your grandfather's brother, and this was the first car your grandfather dad, and it was taken just before they scrapped that car in an accident, you know? So so my grandmother was explaining to us the 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 pictures. All right? So in a sense, my grandmother is the tradition that gives the authentic understanding of the text, which is the pictures. In the early church, there was an oral tradition that was handed from the apostles down to their communities and through their communities that gave the explanation. Now, if somebody all of a sudden arrives and says, no, 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 that's not your cousins, that's... Um, uh, that's my cousins, and that's not your grandfather's first car. That was actually the first Model T off the assembly line, and that's in a museum over there. Now, the people who are related to the person who took the picture says, you're full of. <laughs> and your explanation does not go into this book, you know. So, so in a sense, that's what was happening in the early Christian community. These people were coming and making up their stories, to pass their philosophy on through that. But these other people were saying, no, 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 we know the stories. You know, I studied with this man who studied with the apostle. I know that does not fit. And, and then Irenaeus says, and it does not fit because of that and that and that and that and that, you know. And, and ultimately, when you, when you take the Gnostic writings, you realize that as a system, it, is, it stands in complete contradiction to the Jewish tradition and, and to the teaching of Jesus. So that what you would have to say is that if the Gnostic tradition made sense, then you have to go like Marcy, and you have to scrap all of the Jewish tradition, all the Old Testament, and you have to scrap the teachings of Jesus. And you're left with a kind of a teaching that just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't speak to my heart, you know? So, so it's clear that those texts that were set aside don't fit into... Uh, except for some, like, the, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a text called the Didache. The Didache means the teaching. It's a text that we have. It was, it was read in some churches. It is a fine text. But it wasn't kept in Scripture because it was clearly not tied to one of the apostles. It's a text from about the year 120. 
you know, but it's not tied to any of the apostles, so it was not kept as scripture. But it's a fine text, and it's a text that we use when we study, you know, the second century of Christianity. We go to that text to see how the second sec- century Christianity evolved. So the Didache, or the pastor of Hermas, is another text. So there are texts that are fine Christian texts, or the letters, say, of Clement, the letters of Clement, uh, who was one of the first of the second generation of Christians, you know, um, what we what we in the Catholic Church would call bishops now, or episcopoi, overseers. Clement at one point is being brought to, to, to his death. In, uh, and so on the way, he writes letters to the communities that he meets. I mean, those letters were written maybe 50 years after the letters of Paul. Those letters are, are good letters. We don't read them as scripture in church, but for example, they're part of the text that we read uh, in what we call the Liturgy of the Hours, the priests and religious pray every day. We read excerpts of those texts because they're, they're very inspiring texts from the second century. But, but they're not part of Scripture. They are not. They do not establish the rule of faith for us. You know, uh, Reverend Rennie. Yeah. It's it's a good question, huh? It's true that Paul at one point speaks about, you know, I was I was taken up into the seventh heaven or the third heaven or whatever it is. And basically what he's speaking there obviously is a is a kind of a a mystical experience, right? Um there there are a number of places in in scriptures, in the writings of Paul, in the letter of um of Jude, the letter of Jude, um in the book of Revelation. There are a number of places where we find language that is very close to Gnostic language, all right? Um, And it's... uh, Now, did the Gnostics get inspired and adapt those texts and develop their stuff? Or were the writers kind of writing in language that was common language in their time? It's hard for us to tell which way the influence ran, you know, how it, it corresponded. But... But in the Christian tradition, for example, we recognize that the language of Paul is a symbolic language. We, we do not deduce from it that there are levels to heaven. It's not part of the Christian faith that there are levels to heaven. We recognize that it's a symbolic language. What the Gnostics did is take it and make it some kind of a system, systematized. But it's true that when you read scripture, there are a number of places where the language is... Or, for example, Paul at one point, the Gnostics are always talking about mystery. Well, Paul is saying in Jesus Christ, the mystery that was kept hidden from all ages is now revealed. But what is the mystery? The mystery is not a system in order to be free. He says the mystery is that the salvation which was offered to the Jewish people is now offered to all people in Jesus Christ. That's the mystery. (laughs) Well, it's not a great mystery. And then he says, and go proclaim that mystery to everybody. He doesn't say keep it to a small little select few and you've got to be initiated. No, it's a mystery that be shared for everyone. So, so there's language in the scriptures that sound like Gnostic language but have a very different meaning within the Christian tradition. Yeah. Uh, it's, there are names. Um, we know of... Uh, we know of some important Gnostic philosophers. Um, I have a list here, for example, um, Simon Magnus, uh, Lucius Carinus, Menander, Saturninus, Menoimus, Carpocrates, Bardason of Edessa, uh, Valentinus, Basilides, Marcion of Sinope. You know, so, so we know names of important Gnostic thinkers. Um, I don't know enough about Gnosticism to know if we have texts that can be ascribed directly to some of them uh, or if all the texts we have are are anonymous. Um, But we have to realize that in in the Bible, too, we have texts that we don't know the author. We don't know the author of the letter to the Hebrews. We don't know the letter, the author of uh, uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, 1 Titus. We don't know those authors. Um, we're really not sure if the author of the book of Revelation, who calls himself John, is the same as the John of who wrote the gospel. Uh, we're not sure of that. You know, so, so we have to realize that in the New Testament, there are books we don't know the authors. And in the Old Testament, most of the books we don't know the authors, except the prophets. 
you know, Joel was written, the book of Joel was written by Joel, the book of uh, uh, Ezekiel was written by Ezekiel, but, you know, who wrote, uh, who wrote one and two chronicles, who wrote, there, there's an old tradition that Moses wrote the first five books, but most scripture scholars today would, would say that's not true, you know, it was developed over a period of five centuries, you know, so different people wrote until the, the final text was shaped. But uh, I, I think most of the Gnostic texts, we, we have difficulty with most of the Gnostic texts identifying exactly where they're from, exactly when they were written, and exactly which branch of Gnosticism they belong to. So it's, it's a whole field of study by itself. I mean, if you want to do a doctoral dissertation, you, it's, it's wonderful stuff. To, it's very strange and wild stuff to go, to go study. And one one last thing, question. One yeah. thing. Did, did, the, did the Catholic Church suppress these Gospels? Uh, it is clear that the writers like Irenaeus and the bishops of Alexandria said, look, these are the right texts. Those texts are not to be, re not to be read. They, 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 uh, they detract us from the teaching of Jesus. So uh, when they said that, those texts were, you know, if I'm in a monastery and the bishop says that text is not receivable, then I take it and I put it in the dump you know, because I'm not going to keep it. So in that sense, they were suppressed in the sense that the monasteries did not, did not keep them. And since the Gnostic groups were a very fringe group, there were very few Gnostic libraries that were left. Nag Hammadi is a Gnostic library that was dis rediscovered. Somebody suggests that um, the, the great library of Alexandria might have collected all those Gnostic texts, but it was destroyed, and we, we, we're not even sure how that was destroyed. It probably destroyed over three different centuries, you know, so it's hard to know the story. But no great conspiracy to, no, no great conspiracy, just a clear indication that these texts do not fit in and so are not to be kept by Christians and so Christians got rid of them. And since Christianity became the major religion, the, the texts were, didn't survive, didn't survive, you know. Yes? It, yeah, in, in the Da Vinci Code, what he does is he takes the Last Supper. He has Leonardo uh, paints the Last Supper and the figure of John, the beloved disciple. He says, well, really, that's a woman, you know, and that's Mary Magdalene. It's not John. And, and she's the real uh, Holy Grail, you know. There's not, there's not a single specialist of Da Vinci who buys into that. They all agree that it's that it's the disciple John. The disciple John was always portrayed in kind of um, feminine. How can you say not mature, virile traits? Because John traditionally is a is a, a young boy, so so he's not portrayed as a virile man like the other disciples. Not just Da Vinci, but a number of painters of that time. So that's no, no, no. That it's Mary Magdalene next to Jesus. No, no, no that's not true. That's that's fiction. No, the, when you say, does the church, meaning does the Pope, the Pope will not tell you to go see or not go see a movie. Um, I, I know of no bishops. I, I remember there was, there was one bishop, uh, Bertone, who's the bishop of, um, uh, where is he, in Italy. He used to be uh, Cardinal Ratzinger's second-hand man at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. He gave a talk and he told the Catholics in his diocese, don't read it, it's crap. Well, the newspapers reported it, uh, the Vatican puts uh, Da Vinci Code on the index, you know. Oh, 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 oh. There's no index in the Catholic Church. There's no list of prescribed books, forbidden books to be read. Uh, I would say go see the Da Vinci Code. Go see it. Too many people are going to go see it, not to, ta not to go see it and be able to, to talk about it and reflect about it. Go see it. Enjoy it. It'll be a good movie. Tom Hanks always makes good movies, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it'll be an exciting movie if you remember that half of it is not true. You know, that's, that's you know. All right? Very good. It's 8.30. Uh, won't be able to... One last question? So, so the question here is, um, what is the real status of Judas? I have no idea. I, I have no idea, and I would say the majority of, of serious scripture scholars and theologians have no idea. Um, in John's gospel, in John's gospel, the divinity of Jesus is always pushed forward, you know. Um, whereas in the other three gospels, we see more as humanity. 
So John is always kind of pushing the fact that Jesus knew everything that was happening, you know, that Jesus could, knew that this was going to happen. That practically seems to say that, that Judas was kind of uh, ordained or predestined, but predestination does not fit into the Christian, um, well, certainly not into the Catholic uh, theology. We do not believe in predestination. So, so Judas was a free man. Now, did he use his freedom willfully or in ignorance? You know, who knows? And so uh, the old story is that we always pray, we, we believe there is a hell, but we always pray that hell is empty. <laughs> that's, that's the prayer that we make, that, that nobody has been damned forever, you know, including Judas. We pray for him too, okay? So there we go. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a great evening. And, uh... <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And, um, and next time I give a talk on a Pope's encyclical, you're all welcome to come out. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone.